We're ready? Okay. I don't even know what to say. Good evening, good afternoon. For Spain, this is good siesta. So I hope you guys are rested. <laughs> okay, so uh, we even have music. Thank you. <laughs> so today, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. How many, I I'm just curious, how many of you are actually German? Raise your hands. Whoa, that's awesome. Spaniards, any Spaniards here? Ooh, two people, thank you. Okay, so uh, pleasure to be here. You guys, if you guys are from Berlin, you have a fantastic city, by the way. So uh, keep coming every month or something like that. <laughs> um, so today we're gonna talk about the, uh, the startup story. I wanna, it's pretty basic stuff what I'm gonna talk about, but uh, I think a lot of people keep forgetting, especially the ones that haven't gone through all the phases of the startup uh, cycle. So I'm going to try to, to give an overview of what normally happens, how you start from the very beginning all the way to, uh, I was going to put IPO, but that's kind of a little weird. <laughs> okay, so my name is Alex. Uh, you have the slides will be uploaded tonight at the SlideShare. Um, you have my Twitter there. But of course, no one has internet connectivity here because you don't have a cable, so it doesn't, that doesn't matter. So uh, a very quick overview on what I, uh, who am I? I'm Alex, and what I've been doing. So I've been doing startups since 2006 or something like that. Um, been involved with many other startups. Uh, my first one that was called Inksy. Hey, my first one that was called Inksy was about um, semantic analysis and stuff like that. Then I co-founded with my partner, Stetuan Valley, which was one of the first uh, startup accelerator programs in Spain. Um, even though we were based in Spain, we were operating with uh, teams from everywhere. We had uh, teams from Singapore, from Germany, from France, uh, from the US. Uh, when I was there, I, was, uh, I also was working at 20. Who knows here 20? I'm just curious about it. Eh, a couple. Well, 20 is the largest social network in Spain, which is like not saying too, too many things, but uh, it's, it, it was pretty awesome. I mean, the experience was pretty awesome. And when I came out of there, uh, I started Tetuan Valley. That kind of evolved into Okuri Ventures, which was a, a VC firm, a venture capital firm. So I don't know why. I, I'm a developer myself, so I don't know how I ended up being an investor. One day I woke up and said like, oh, I have all this money to invest. And just let me tell you something, it's fucking boring. I don't know if anyone has ever thought about being an investor, it's fucking boring. You know, creating product is way better. And then I drop, uh, well through there we launched uh, Startup Bootcamp Europe. How many of you know Startup Bootcamp Europe? There's actually Startup Bootcamp Berlin. And uh, I left the company last year to start my third company that, was called, that is called Press42 which essentially what we do is we connect startups with uh, bloggers uh, globally. So we help startups communicate their story, their message in a better way. And uh, we teach them how to write stuff, how to spin the things they're doing and when they should spin the things they're doing. Uh, essentially through there I became uh, editor for The Kernel Magazine, which is a tech blog out of London. So I'm essentially involved in uh, the media and startups alike. So the first question I, I normally ask people is how, how we got here, okay? How, how do we end up being an entrepreneur? And here there's a lot of debate on what is an entrepreneur. Does the entrepreneur it gets born or is it make? Do you make an entrepreneur or, or you need to have some kind of qualities? So you have different types of people that come to ent entrepreneurship. The first one, and this is probably very, very true for Spain, is I just got fired, so I'm going to start a company, okay? This is a little bit bullshit, if you ask me. Uh, there's some people that are capable of doing this, but most people is just like, I don't have anything to do, so I'm, I'm just gonna do a startup. Well, I don't know if you know, like, right now being a, an entrepreneur is, is kind of cool. You go to any, to any restaurant or to any event, and you go to the, to the queue, and they ask you, oh, are you on the list? And you go like, no, I have a startup. They go, oh, please, please come in. Okay, so it's kind of cool to do a startup thing now. 
The other one is the, uh, the unemployment effect, also known as Spain. Okay? Um, there's a lot of people, especially uh, people coming out from university, and in, in the case of Spain, we have a 40% 40, 40 unemployment rate in under 30, in people in under 30s. Okay, so that means that there's a lot of capable and prepared people that cannot get a job. So what they're actually turning is to startups. They're saying, okay, if no one is going to hire me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create my own company. The third one is, uh, and you probably know, so who has an MBA here? No one has an MBA? You have an MBA, no? Okay. You know, I have an MBA, and the coolest thing about having an MBA is not having an MBA, is being able to give MBA shit. It's the best thing you can get your MBA for. But there's a lot of people from MBAs that they come to you and they say, hey, you know, I've done this project on my MBA. For two years I've been working on this project. And you know, I'm smarter than anywhere else. You know, and I just need a couple of coders to build my startup. And you go like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay. And this is, this normally doesn't end up well. In not a single one of the people I've met doing this, it never really ended up well. And finally, uh, you have this guy, which I hope most people are like this guy. And here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes. Who knows this? Please raise your hand. This is fucking disappointing. <laughs> the ones that didn't recognize this quote, please, can you leave the stage? <laughs> this is uh, Apple uh, advertising from 1981. Okay, if you haven't seen it, definitely check YouTube because it's a fantastic advertising. This are, this are most of the people, or hopefully this should be what entrepreneurs are. You know, it's people that they've never really fit. People that when you got your job, you end up having a fight with your boss for some reason, probably because he's retarded or something like that. And you end up doing like side projects, you end up doing weird things that people don't normally do. Remember, I went to computer, uh, computer science school. And how weird it is to have a student association that is called the computer club in computer science. Okay, it's fucking weird, okay? It was like the weirdo section of the university. So hopefully, you start here. Hopefully, you're someone that you've always been a rebel. You've always wanted to do things your way. And you've always been packed with ideas. And that kind of brings us to the part of the idea stage. Okay, there's a lot of people that when they want to start a company, they say, okay, first you need an idea. And they will go like, oh yeah, I have this idea of social local app to real time. It's like Facebook like on steroids, blah, 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 blah. Okay, you know how many fucking times I've heard that? <laughs> many times. Now the question is, what different type of idea situations you can have, okay? You have the pub idea. Okay, this is, this is usually the moment where everyone's totally fucked up at night. And someone comes to you and say like, oh, hey, hey, I got it, I got it. The Instagram for feet. You go like, what the fuck are you talking about? But it's so freaking funny that at that point you actually buy the domain instagramforfeet.com. Okay, the next morning you don't know why you did that, but at that point it seemed like a really good idea. This is for all the guys here. If you ever have an idea, the, the best thing you can actually do is ask a woman. Ask women about your idea. Okay, we are fucking stupid. Okay, we get excited with really stupid ideas. So just double check with a, with a woman and ask her, hey, what do you think about this? Most of the time she will look at you and she will go like, what did you drink yesterday? <laughs> okay, so when she, when she says that, when she says that, okay, just drop the idea. Trust me, she is right, okay? Then you have the MBA idea. Okay, again, it's a connection with what we saw before. Is this guys that have been working on this fantastic idea on paper. They've written this thing that is like 200 page long. Shit. They know all the stats, all the metrics, absolutely everything. But the idea is fantastic. But they've never ever seen a fucking computer. And you go like, okay, that is great. And then you have the Google idea. This is, this is actually, uh, I want to stop here because this, this is important. There's, way too many people that think that to start a company you need to have the Google idea. That is just not true. The Google guys never had the fucking Google idea. 
As I always say, the Google guys were fucking failures. They actually fail at selling their freaking company technology to someone. They were actually forced to do a startup. They wanted to sell the technology to Alta Vista, and they wouldn't buy. They would try to sell it to Yahoo and wouldn't buy. They said, like, okay, well, we'll just keep going. Okay, let's see what happens. Okay, I wish I had those failures, by the way. But still, a failure from a startup point of view. Okay, so be careful when you're thinking about an idea about starting something. Don't stress out. Don't, don't wait for that brilliant idea, for that magic idea, because it's not going to happen. That's not how it works, okay? And finally, you always have this, guys. Oh my god, oh my god, what can I do? I want to do a startup, but I don't have an idea. And you go like, what? Yeah, yeah, no, no, I don't have ideas. And you go like, well, you know, everyone has ideas. No, no, but I don't have ideas. <laughs> you go like, well, you probably have ideas, but you didn't realize this. No, 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 I don't have ideas, okay? To these people, I will tell them the same thing, okay? From when someone tells you that, ask them to think on what they're gonna see from their way, from there to their way home, and start analyzing all the things that piss you a lot on your way home. So normally, this is typical, you're crossing a crossroad and the, the lights are not working, or you get into the U-Bahn and it's not working, and there's something you go like, holy shit, there should be someone to fix this stuff. It doesn't work. Wi-Fi doesn't work here. You know, that kind of stuff. And think about it, write it down, and do this for five days. I mean, every day, with all the ideas you got to fix things, most of the things won't be parts that you are capable of doing, but still, they're good ideas. Choose three of them and do this for five days. And at the end of the fifth day, just get all the ideas and take the three best ones. And if after that you don't have ideas, you shouldn't be doing startups, definitely. Okay? And then you have the NDA, okay? This is also very, very typical. The startup comes and they go like, no, I'm sorry. Uh, and, and they actually, they kind of pitch it like this. They come to you and say like, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, you know? Uh, you need to sign an NDA. Everyone knows what an NDA is? Non-disclosure agreement, okay? So essentially they'll ask you to sign some papers to read their idea. Because you know, ideas are so fucking unique that no one has them. How many people know how many Facebook, how many people claiming I invented Facebook, but I never really developed it? You know, lucky me. <laughs> okay, so careful with these people, they think that the idea is the most important part of it. After a while, you realize that idea is just like the stupidest thing you can actually have. That's the reason when I talk with a lot of startups, I tell them, don't care about the idea. The idea is not the important part. I don't give a shit about your idea. Actually, in most cases, I will say like, your idea, as it is, is going to fucking fail. But don't worry, keep doing it. You know, and they look at you like, what, what, what did he just say? Okay, so careful with this. The idea is not the most important thing. I always, I always give the same metaphor. If you, if you get a, a stone and you throw it from a, from a slide and you mark with an X the point you're throwing the stone from and you kick it and it falls down the slope, it ends up here. If you get the exact same stone, put it in the exact same place and you kick it again, it will end up there. So this is about execution. It's not about the freaking idea. Everyone has ideas, absolutely everyone, even those that say they don't have ideas. So now we start with the first steps, okay? Now we have an idea, maybe I have several ideas. I want to do a company, I want to do something. And then you have the first type, okay? Those are the guys that are also probably some kind of uh, F uh, family of the MBAs and they will come with their PowerPoint and they say like, hey, check my PowerPoint. This is my new startup. And you go like, what the fuck is this? No, this is my new startup. You go like, no, this is a PowerPoint. Well, that's my new startup. And you go like, okay. Uh, luckily for us, this is not working anymore. This used to work for a lot of people for many years. It's not working anymore. So if you're trying to do startup, I mean, a PowerPoint a presentation is, is fantastic, it's great, you, ha you need to have it, but don't rely on that, okay? It's not gonna work. No one is going to invest, no one's gonna join your startup based on a PowerPoint. Especially not with the fucking PowerPoint quality that most people do. For example, this. Okay, some tips on communication. Okay, let's give a talk. You shouldn't use a lot of text. Okay, you know, why I should put this slide on the screen when you can actually read it? Okay, 
uh, if I'm going to put this amount of text, then I shouldn't be here. Then you have, and this is fantastic. Maybe it's because I'm turning into half developer, half designer now. But I don't know if you can actually see it from here. But that, that is a shitty image. Okay, That is a pixelated image. The reason is because the original image is this small. Okay, there's so many people that they see a thumbnail and they go like, oh my god, this thumbnail is so cute. The, this kitty is so nice. Let's make it like 10, 24, for 700. It just looks fantastic. Look at that, that pixel. Oh no, it's, it's the eye. Okay, don't do this. Don't freaking do this. And of course, you cannot see it from there, but this image has a watermark. I've seen and I promise this, I've seen TEDx presentations of people using images with freaking watermarks, okay? Fucking buy the image. It's 10 bucks. It's not that hard. Or find another one. There are more images like that. And finally, this is one of my favorite. Have you ever realized that if you go to see a presentation from a scientist, or uh, like someone in physics or, or someone that's a doctor, they always fucking put slides that have blue background with j fucking yellow letters. And it's freaking ugly, okay? And you go to lawyers and they have their own freaking style, also really freaking ugly. So please, okay, no text, no yellow with blue, black with white, white with black, easy. Keep it fucking easy. And of course, this is what I see in so many startup competitions. The startup comes on stage. They use their PowerPoint to dazzle everyone. And when the presentation finishes, the jury asks the following question. So what exactly does your startup do? You go like, OK, you were, fucking, you were pitching for 10 minutes, and no one got what you were doing. Wrong, OK? There's one thing that's called talking with your mama, OK? You have your presentation, you present it to your mother. If she doesn't get it, rewrite it, please. Okay? Rewrite it. It's not going to work for the jury. And of course, the second question that startups get, get asked when they finish the presentation is, okay, I'm not sure I got what you are doing, but how are you going to make money? Again, freaking failure. I mean, the two number one questions your presentation has to answer is, what are you doing, and how are you going to make money? You, would, you wouldn't, well, maybe some of you would believe this, but you wouldn't believe how many startups pitch in a startup competition that never, ever answer this stuff. I've had one of the top investors in Spain asking me, next to me, after 20 minutes of presentation, ask me, so what exactly do these guys do? I said, like, okay, this is retarded. Okay, this shouldn't happen. Then we have the second, the second stage. Okay, uh, so some people think that with a PowerPoint presentation you can you can get a, you can do a startup. Then you have the people that think that with a business plan you can do a startup. Okay, and they write this. Uh, normally they're they're uh, f uh, family of the MBAs too, and they work hard. They write a lot of stuff. Okay. With me, everyone. I, I want everyone to repeat this quote. No one reads it. One, two, three, okay? No one reads this shit. No one fucking reads 200 pages. No one. It's useless. It's useless to do a business plan. Okay, no, I'll, I'll correct that. It's not useless to do, to do a business plan. It's useless to do a business plan and then send it to someone. Okay? The doing the business plan part is actually pretty cool. But then once you've done it, you just throw it away because it's, it's useless at that point. The thing is, a lot of people, and especially in very conservative countries like Spain and, and, or very financial, financially oriented countries, uh, also in London you see this, they ask for a lot of numbers. We want numbers. I, I even heard one investor asking for numbers for financial projections for five years. You go like, what are you talking about? Like five years, these guys are not going to live after the third month. What are you talking? Okay, the thing is, in three years, we all be dead. Okay, so there is no point on throwing numbers that long. Doing numbers is great. Okay, don't get me wrong. Doing financial projections is fantastic because it, al it actually allows you to see how the entrepreneurs are thinking about their business. And if I see a number, first of all, I won't believe the number. But I will ask you, how did you reach up this number? How did you end up with this number? 
and I want to listen to your processing. I want to listen to what you thought to get that number. And if it's crazy, I'll say, because actually this normally happens. First year of a company, we're going to make 4 million euros. And you go like, yeah, sure, okay. Okay, so please explain me how you're going to do that. Okay, so be careful with the business plans. It's good to have them, but once you have them, just throw them away. They're useless. In reality, a business plan is, is a wish list. Is if we live in the magical world of the unicorns and the, uh, and the happy bears, this would be my wish list for my company. I would love to have a company that, this, that earns 4 million euros the first year, and we have this amount of people that we're hiring, and we have 10 million users, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's the, uh, it's the Santa Claus list. Okay, and treat it like, like that, because you know, there are too many variables in the equation to be able to capture that on any plan. And then we come with startup competitions, okay? So you can either go to the, with a PowerPoint, uh, you can either go with a business plan, or you can try and get into a startup competition. I mean, I have an issue with startup competitions. I've, I've been in several ones, and uh, this is what it got. It, they're, they're actually interesting. It gets you to think about your, your business. It, it normally pushes you to write a business plan, which a lot of people don't have. So uh, as I said, there's this fantastic quote that says, you know, planning is everything, the plan is nothing. Okay, so the planning process is fantastic. So this startup competition should actually push you to do that. And that's good, that's very good. The second thing they do is, they allow you to polish your presentation. Okay, because you're gonna present, so you, you get to make the presentation, you get to test it out, to see how people react to it. And hey, hey, if you win something, fantastic, okay? So there's a, a positive side to startup competitions. The downside of competitions is that normally there's a lame reward, okay? It's like, hey, you're been working your ass for three fucking months, and how many of you are developers here? Raise your hand. Okay, so nearly like half of you are developers. So how much does it, does it hurt when someone tells you you have to stop coding to write this bullshit, okay? It hurts a lot, okay? So you're in your bat cave, coding this stuff, you're gonna fix the world, and someone tells you you, you need to spend a year, uh, a month, writing this business plan and doing this presentation. And then you go on stage, you present it, you win the competition, and they tell you, hey, there you go, some coupons for the Burger King. And you go like, what, what? So I, I came to this competition for this? And this is what normally, I mean, there are very few competitions that have real, real uh, impact. Uh, from an investor point of view, from, uh, from the media point of view. Okay, very, very few startup competitions have that. And you know what? I'm not going to lose three months for 5,000 euros. That's bullshit. Okay, so they have this downside. Then you have the startup weekends and the hackathons. This for me, it's, it's funny because some years ago I thought it was, it was kind of lame. Now I will tell you it's probably one of the best resources you can do for, for a startup. The first one is if you, you find co-founders there. It's very easy to find someone that is a coder and someone that can help you out with a startup and share opium, like in the picture, okay? The downside is that normally the idea you work at at those hackathons is a pretty lame idea as it is. I'm not saying that the idea is not good. I'm not saying that the product can be very good. But at that point, at that stage, the idea is pretty lame. And what happens is that normally you have a clash of egos. Normally, the people you're surrounded will say like, no, 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 we're gonna do this. Normally because they don't have the experience with doing startups. So they get extremely excited with the idea. They try to push it as hard as possible. It fucking fails, as it should. And then the group dissolves itself, you know, and you end up with no co-founders at all. So I think it's, it's, it's a great resource. It's something you should definitely try. And it's a, a very good way of finding co-founders, but normally they don't normally belong to your team. It's someone else you've met during the event. So do a lot of networking when you go to these events, which is actually very, very helpful. Incubation spaces. Okay, this is one of my favorite. Okay, I'm sorry, this is not the freaking matrix. Okay, people think that you get into this incubation space and you will suddenly get a charge of what doing startups is. You know, I get into this place and boom, now I know how to do the next Facebook. Boom, now I'm gonna meet Mark Zuckerberg, he's gonna walk through the door and he's gonna give me one million dollars. Okay, it's not gonna happen, okay? An incubation space is a place with some fucking desks, okay? 
That's about it. It is very hard to make this work. There's one thing that is really, really cool, which is one thing you have in, uh, in an incubation space is that you have peer pressure, which in general, in Europe, we lack a lot. Okay, come on, I'm from Spain. How can I freaking work when I have sunshine outside, I have my swimming pool, I have the beach, I have nice Spanish women, you know? I'm not gonna work, it's hard for me to work there, okay? So being in an incubation space actually gives you a lot of peer pressure. And that's fantastic. That's one of the things you actually see in the valley. When you go to Silicon Valley, I mean, don't try and, go, don't try and get home at five. Your friends there are going to go like, what are you doing, man? You go like, I'm going home. You go like, no, no, we have to code this shit until 2 a.m. in the morning. You go like, okay, uh, we need to do this? Yeah, 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 we need to do this, okay? And that's fantastic. That's actually one of the things that we're missing in Europe in general, is peer pressure. We live very good lives here in Europe. So... Very few people actually are hungry to stay forever doing the startup thing. The downside of these places is that depending on the country and depending on who runs them, they might work or they might not work. So I know a couple of incubation spaces that they're like the most retarded idea you could ever see. You have this fantastic space packed with startups, really smart people, really cool projects. And when you go and talk with your friend, you go like, hey, so what are these guys doing? And he goes like, I don't know. You go like, what? You're like, yeah, I don't know, we don't talk. You're like, you don't what? No, no, we don't talk. They go there, they work, they leave. We go, we work, we leave. And you go like, isn't that like defeating the whole point of the incubation space? Oh no, it's just like, they're very shy. <laughs> this happens in many incubators. Okay, those of you, if there's some people, I know there's a lot of people from the UK. So those of you that are from the UK, if you've ever heard of Tech Hub, also Tech Hub have, has that issues too. Okay, so there's a lot of incubation spaces that they have this problem, that people don't network, people don't relate, don't talk with other startups, which is bullshit. And then my darling, my accelerators, this is so super cool, you know, everyone has a freaking accelerator on their backyard now. It is great for newbies. If you've never done a startup, this is a fantastic opportunity of getting off the ground. Actually, here I will add something that you need to take into, into, uh, into uh, account if you think about accelerators. An accelerator in Europe is very different from an accelerator in the US. In the US, the, the mid-level of people is way higher in terms of entrepreneurship uh, thinking than in Europe. That means that they really get with a pretty, they, they enter the accelerator programs with a very, very high mentality, a very, very high level, and they use it to accelerate their project. In Europe, that's not the case. In most countries, in most cities, what accelerators actually do is bridge the gap that we have with our peers in the US, for example. So don't, don't try to equiparate both because they're different in different regions and different cities. That being said, if you've never done a startup, this is the best way, in my opinion, to actually get through it. It actually gets you started. You, you have peer pressure. And especially if, if you work for Wira, like she does, you know, it's cool, you know? You get your startup and you get the Telefonica logo next to it. It's just like, oh yeah, Telefonica startup, eh? Go Wira. <laughs> but it, it is true. You're essentially riding on the wings on, on a pretty big brand. If you guys know Y Combinator in the US, it's the same. If you talk with startups in Y Combinator, you will see that, especially the last batches, will tell you, you know, there's nothing special about this. I mean, it's the fact that you went for, through Y Combinator and you have the brand, you have the seal of approval. You know, oh, you were selected to go through YC. You know, and that is very important, actually. Then you have the mentors and the advisors. It's pretty cool, you know, the elders. They're there, the, the council of elders that will come and tell you, okay, this is how you need to do your startup. This is how you're gonna make a million. Just don't fucking listen to them, okay? <laughs> please, please. This is the, the other good thing they have is the demo day, okay? It's a, the day where, in theory, a lot of people come to see your pitch and they will invest some money. The problem is, there is a lot of copycats. How many of you have ever heard of the phrase cargo cult? Raise your hand. Few people. Okay, cargo cult is, is, a, is a notion, it's a behavior that happened after the Second World War in, in Indonesia. 
So the Americans established a lot of bases around there to bomb the Japs. And uh, so in a lot of these islands, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of tribes that had never, ever had contact with, with other, other species. And they were like fascinated by these guys that they had, they had like this shiny, shiny uh, birds that came from the sky and brought a lot of presents. They actually thought that they were gods. After the war, they left the bases. And the tribes didn't know what actually happened. They said, like, we've angered the gods. They're not coming back from the sky. They're not bringing presents. They're not bringing gifts to us. So what they started doing is this behavior that's called cargo cult, which is they started replicating the things the Americans had on the airfields. So they started using, like, wooden sticks to do like this to the air to see if the airplanes actually came back, okay? This, is, this behavior is, called as, is known as cargo cult, and there's a lot of companies that do this. You know, do you think that by having uh, puffs and, and shiny colors on your office, you're going to be Google? That's not going to happen. That is cargo cult. Do you think that by means of doing hackathons in your company, you're going to create the next Facebook? It's probably not going to happen. Those things are reflections of a behavior. They're reflections of a corporate culture. They're not the corporate culture. Okay. So there is a lot of accelerated programs that are behaving like that. They're saying, okay, we want to do our own startup st stuff, you know? So it's going to be a three-month program. It's, we're going to have gazillion mentors. We're going to have this and this. We're going to have a demo day. There's actually very few original startup accelerators in Europe and in the U.S., by the way. So be careful with the whole notion of cargo cult. Make sure you know who is running the, pro the program. You want to have someone with entrepreneurial expertise running the program. There's a lot of programs that are run by people that come from the corporate world, that come from the banking world. Fucking avoid them. Trust me. And then you have the mentors. This is, I, I have a whole post about mentors, okay? Mentors are, most of them are a fraud, okay? There's these guys that they love to note around and say, hey, you know, I'm a mentor at C-Camp. Yeah. You know, I'm cool enough to get called to these events and talk with startups. Okay, be careful with mentors. Most of them are full of shit. You should listen to the mentors. Listen with open mind, okay? But then take your own decisions. I remember having this conversation with a startup. They said, hey, we want to do this. And I said, like, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's going to work. You know, my intuition tells me that's probably not a good idea. And he told me, well, maybe you're right. I said, like, wrong, wrong, dude. You know your market better than I do, or you should. So you shouldn't listen to what I'm telling you. You should tell me, hey, Alex, you're full of shit. You know, I know my market way better than you do. So shut the fuck up and listen to what I have to say. Okay, be careful with the mentors. Most of them have never, ever done a startup. Really. You can learn a lot from them, but careful. Open mind here. Okay, and of course, this is the SMTMDD. Someone knows this? Show me the money at the fucking demo day. That's the whole point of the demo day. You know, there's so many accelerator programs that they promise you a lot of investment and the best investors and blah, 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 and you never see a freaking dime. Well, no, that's wrong. That sh shouldn't be like that. I, I actually translated this. I don't know if it's correct. For me, zoom shorter. I don't know if it sounds as good as the one in, in English. It's good? Okay. Sorry, my German is nicht gut. And finally, you know, you keep growing up and you go through these programs and it gets to a point when you, while you're inside these programs or you're starting with your company that you need some validation. You need to validate what you're doing. Actually, I love this picture because this really reflects what a lot of startups actually do. It's like, yeah, let's do this shit. It's like, uh, it's, it's yeah, actually the other way around. The first one is, and this might seem really stupid, but what is your problem? What problem are you fixing? You ask your peers, what is your startup fixing? And they will go like, uh, mm, uh, uh, mm, uh, 25 minutes later, they go like, and this is our problem. And you go like, okay, you have no fucking idea what you're solving. Okay, so please get out. This has a lot to do, those of you that have heard about lean startups, this has a lot to do, this is lean startups, is get the fuck out of your office. Talk with people. 
How many of you have a startup? And be honest with this. How many of you have a startup and have talked with real customers that are giving you money and you've listened to more than 10 of those? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, this is the issue. It's fantastic that you build a product, but you need to go outside. You need to talk with the people because actually you are not wizards. We are really, humans are really bad at simulating shit. So even if you know your field, even if you know what you're doing, you will be surprised when you talk with customers. Are you, were you or weren't you surprised when you talk with your customers? Always, there you go. Important, another question you need to ask once you know you're fixing something is, is this the best solution? Is what we are actually building helping in alleviating the pain my customers are having? A lot of people just don't, don't ask this question. It's like, no, no, we're building this stuff. This is going to be super cool. Everyone's going to use it. And then they throw it around and no one uses it. And they go like, no, but we know there is an issue. They, we know there is a problem here. Okay? The thing is that what you built is not what people are looking for. It's not useful for them to get rid of the pain. Finally, you start growing up. And at one point, you need to start thinking about getting some money. Okay? Theoretically, once you've actually talked with people and you've talked with customers and you have a clear idea of what you want to build, now is the time to start thinking about investment. Now, there's two paths you can actually take here. Path number one, it's what's called bootstrapping, which is, you know, I have some money. I'm just going to use my retirement fund to, <laughs> to create my startup and I'm going to pay for everything. This is actually very typical from countries where there is not a very big uh, VC industry. For example, Spain, and actually in Germany, until very recently, there wasn't a very, very powerful VC industry either. So there's a lot of people that take this path. The other path, which is essentially very typical from the US, is no, 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 no. We're getting some investment. We're going to have someone to shine our shoes, OK? And actually, it's so, it's so funny because it's so different from one, co from one place to the other one that in the US, actually, very few people even think about bootstrapping a company. It's like the usual AVC is, OK, gather your friends, get the prototype, get $1 million, and keep going. You know, here, when you talk with a European and you go like, OK, phase one, and they go like, find a coder. Phase two, have an idea. Phase three. Ask for some money to someone, I don't know who, maybe another country, maybe. Should we go to Silicon Valley and live there under a bridge or something like that? Okay, so it's a very, very different mentality. And there's nothing wrong with both paths. You can either take one or the other one, or you can start with one and then jump to the other one. Okay, there's nothing really wrong as long as you know what are the consequences of taking investment or not taking it. So one of the questions a lot of startups have is to FFF or not to FFF? And that's not what you're thinking, you dirty minds, OK? Should we raise friends, fools, and family money, or shouldn't we? Some people do it. And the question is, is that enough? It's funny when you ask startups, is for what do you want the money? And they go like, we don't know. We need the money. And I still remember, I was at South by Southwest like two years ago. And I had a friend that went to this private party where, um, where Denz was, uh, the founder, the co-founder of Foursquare. And they, had, they, they recently raised like a five million round there. And he overheard him saying to his friends, oh, we raised five million. I don't even know what to do with that. It's like, how can you raise five million and not know what to do with our money? I mean, and this is, again, this is very European mindset. What? Give, me, give it to me. I'll tell you what you do with it. You know, for us, five million is just like huge. We can do so many things with our money. Okay, but the question is, do you need the money? Be honest with yourself. Do you need the money? Do you need to be the top spot, blah, 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 100 million users in three weeks? Is that how your business is going to work? Do you really need that amount of money? Again, if you raise money, definitely try to raise as much as possible. But always remember that money comes with strings attached. So then you have the, the who, who knows this, guys? 
Who knows the frog guy? Raise your hand if you know the guy in the frog one. Okay, some people. This guy is called Dave McClure and has no kind of relationship with the Simpsons at all. Okay? He is a super angel. He's probably one of the well-known uh, super angels in the U.S. right now. And he has a fund and an, in and an accelerated program that's called uh, 500 Startups. The other guy is, someone actually recognize the other guy? He's Mike Moritz from Sequoia Venture Capital. He's probably the most well-known VC in the world. This guy invested in Google, invested in Facebook, and many other really big hotshots, okay? So the question is, do you want to play with plants or do you want to play with zombies? Do you want to play with angels or do you want to play with VCs? Each one has a different perspective. Make sure, this is like when you go to the bank, I see all these old ladies that they go to the bank and then the, uh, the niece is there saying like, you screwed with, your, with my grandma, you screwed with my grandma. Then you ask yourself like, why the fuck does your grandma sign shit that she doesn't understand? Okay, well this is the same thing with VCs and angels. Do not get money if you don't know what you're getting into. Read a lot, invest, uh, do research, know who you're talking to, know, know who the investor is. It, different investors do different things. So please do your homework. And once you know what you're getting into, then get into it. Because after all, when you have dollar one in your company from someone that's not you, you have a boss. This is what people that, start, that do startups after getting fired from a, from a 20 year old job, they will go like, oh, no, no, I want to do my startup because I want to be my own boss. And you go like, ha, 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 you, you don't know what you're getting into, okay? The moment you take dollar one that's not yours, you're not the boss anymore. So for, by all means, take it if you need it, but make sure you understand the consequences of doing this. So, okay, you know, you get a seed round. You get 200K, you get 100K. Now that's a plus five for the company. And that, this is the point where what I'm seeing so far during this past two years is where shit just hits the fan. Okay, you get a seed round. You get out of your accelerated program or your incubation program. And then this happens, okay? If you haven't noticed, that's you, okay? The other one is the new coolest startups in, startup in town. No one is listening to you anymore. No one is talking about your brand anymore. There's this new cool startup that came out of YC that's doing blah, 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 blah. Okay? So at this point, what happens is it's a freaking desert. No one remembers you. It's a freaking black hole of information. Like the startup raises money, and you never heard from the startup again. How many of you know uh, AngelList? Okay, a couple. AngelList is a website that allows you to put your startup and, and check or try to get investment from angels, mostly in the US. And there's a lot of companies in AngelList that you start following them, seeing what they're doing, and suddenly they raise a seed round and you never hear from them again. And you're like, this is wrong, okay? This is not about raising money. This is about making money. This is about reaching your customers. This is about reaching the media. If you don't know how to do that, and you raise money and you don't learn, you are screwed. There's one of the things that happened to a lot of companies that come out of Seed Camp, Startup Bootcamp, st uh, Rockstar. I hope it's not Startup Pirates. So we have Startup Pirates here, Wira here, so I hope you guys fix that, okay? But it, it's, it's really upsetting that these very cool projects, n you never hear from them again, except when you meet actually, when you actually bump into the entrepreneur. But that's not very scalable, if you ask me. The truth is, during those programs, you've been riding this, this fantastic horse. You've been using the brand of the accelerator or the company that's behind it. And suddenly, they take you out of the accelerator. And guess who are you? OK? You're the gazelle. They just like throw you to the pit. And they say like, come on, you learn everything you need to know. Come on, raise $5 million. Come on, reach out to different countries. Come on, go to the US and open the US market. Okay, it's not gonna happen. You're gonna get eaten by the cheetah, okay? So careful with this. Make sure, make sure you learn how to play your brand. Make sure that you learn how to spin your story. This is an issue. A lot of startups keep thinking that the important part is the container, is the box, is the product. Oh, we have a product. Do we have anyone from Eastern Europe here? Hey, Poland, by any chance? Any Polish guys in the room? There you go, Polish guy. 
So I, I traveled a lot to Poland, and in Poland they have this fantastic thing, which is they think that competing is about features. So you talk with a startup and they go like, no, our startup has blah, 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 blah. And after the third one, you go like, fucking boring. You talk to the next startup and they go like, no, no, we're better than these guys because we have blah, 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 plus blah, blah. And you go like, well, what's the point? Okay, this is not a feature battle. This is not about features. This is about noise. I don't know if you've realized this. This is not about how cool your mobile app is. It's about how the fuck are you going to make me install this shit on my phone? How are you going to make me use it every day? And that has nothing to do with technology. And that has nothing to do with the feature sets you have. Because right now, the barrier of entry to feature sets is freaking ridiculous. Except if you're Israeli. Okay, these guys are incredible. But in general, like any freaking monkey can replicate your app. So that's not your competitive advantage anymore. Not in a place like Europe where startups are booming right now. Do you know how many copycats I hear every time? Every time I go to a different city, there's someone that approaches you and tells, hey, this is my startup. And you go like, yeah, I've heard like three of those in the past two months. How are you going to make me remember yours? That is a question you need to answer. That is a question you need to fix. Let's do an experiment. Wired recently uh, published this list of the hottest European startups. And let's try and do some guessing here. Please raise your hand if you know a single one of these companies. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six people. Whoa, they've done an amazing job. And this guy, you know two, okay, plus two for David. The thing is, this is the 100 hottest startups. They are hot and no one fucking knows about them. How can this even be possible? How did the Wire guys actually did the research? I want to know that. I really want to talk to them and ask them, like, how did you end up with this list? No one knows the startups. Okay, well, some of you know them, but, but they're rare. So they're failing at the most basic thing, which is communicating, talking with people, talking with your customers, going outside, and showcasing what you're doing. For God's sake, hire a writer, okay? If, if I get my, the emails I normally get on my inbox and I analyze the uh, frequency of words, I would probably get something like this list, okay? Number one is leader. We are the market leader. We are leading the market. We are the best. We are the top. We are unique. We are great. We are the solution. We are the largest. We are innovative. We are the innovators. You know, I, I, one, one of them that I'm missing here is I'm a social app, okay? Or I'm a social network. That's missing, but should be there, definitely. Or I'm an app, okay? We do apps. Okay, fucking hire a writer. Get someone on your team. I was recently finishing the uh, book from uh, the, 37, the 37 Signal guys, the, the book called Rework. Someone knows this book? It's very easy. This is what a friend of mine calls, this is the bathroom book. Okay, you go to a bathroom and you read it in the bathroom. And uh, in, the, in the final chapters of the book, there's this thing that he called, he says, if you need to hire someone in your company, the first test you need to make them is make them write something. Because when you see someone writing, when you read what someone has written, you understand how their mind works. If they're clear enough, if they know how to kind of condensate information, if they're really simplistic about the way they expose things, hire fucking writers, please. Don't send me bullshit PRs. And of course, I get this a lot. A lot of friends of mine, they come to me and they say like, hey Alex, we wanna to talk to you because we want, to do, we want you to do our communication strategy. And I'm like, oh my God, that's awesome. That's money for me, you know, great. And I start talking with them and after five minutes, I realize they don't have no fucking clue who their customers are. And you go like, okay, so you're gonna sell something to the freaking ninja and you don't even know what the ninja looks like. Wrong. Communication is gear is targeted towards someone you know who it is, okay? Because you need to craft the message to these people. If you don't know who your customers are, you shouldn't be doing freaking communication directly to them. You, shouldn't, you should be doing something else, not that kind of communication, okay? So make sure you know who your customers are. And of course, you will fail, okay? This is, this is true. You will fail. I don't know if this was clear enough the first time. 
you will fail. And if it's not clear enough, yes, again, you will fail. Okay? The natural state of startups is fucking failing. Get over it. Okay? It's natural. It's usual. It's what happens. You know, you wake up in the morning and you realize we are failing miserably. Fantastic. Okay, maybe in three months we can start another company and we don't fail as miserably as we've done with this one. Okay? It's human nature. Okay, this is a Taoist uh, quote. Okay, the only constant in the world is change things change. And by change, you need destruction and creation. That means that in most cases, the constant that you're going to experience within the lifetime of your startup is essentially failure, is destruction of ideas. And that is normal. That is the usual. Sadly, a lot of people think, or a lot of people, well, actually, yeah, a lot of people think they want this. A lot of entrepreneurs think they want to grow the company. Now we get some money. Now we're going to make it big. And we're going to make it to the cover of Inc. Magazine. We're going to make it to the cover of Business Week. Does someone read the real story behind Dig recently? They told the story. They sold the company for, I think it was 500,000 euros, uh, $1,000 or something like that. No, five, no, no, no 50,000 or something like that. It was, it was ridiculous. It was a company that was valued in 30 million. Okay? So, sadly, still, there's a lot of people that need the fame. There's a lot of people that need the ego. There's a lot of people that when they think about startups, they think about the, the Gulf Stream. They think about their freaking airplane. They think about, oh, you know, everyone's going to respect me now. I'm going to go to Berlin and everyone, you know, they're going to put this uh, red carpet there and they're going to invite me to all the cool places, to all the cool parties. You know, typical uh, private party where, where only stupid media people go <laughs> and other like goofs hang around. But they go like, hey, were you at the private party of Dave McClure? Were you at the private party of Mark Zuckerberg? You know, and people love that shit. When you do this long enough, you realize this is not the point. You shouldn't be doing startups because of this. You should be doing startups because of this. You have to have fun. Be happy. This is about having fun with what you're doing. If you're not having fun, for God's sake, get a job. You'll probably be happier doing that. This is, this is because we don't fit on the normal ecosystem. This is because doing a regular job makes us very, very unhappy. Just enjoy failing. Enjoy not having money. Enjoy eating ramen all day long or pizza, okay? In the end, my friends, enjoy the little things. For one day, you may look back and realize they were the big things. Thank you very much. Do I have time for questions? Five minutes for questions. Some questions? Someone? Come on, don't be shy. I want to eat you. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. It was uh, fun. Uh, I, I want to ask you about um, your opinion on crowdsourcing fun funding, because you've been speaking about two models, uh, VC and uh, uh, also the family money and from my point of view crowdsourcing is also very nice because it gives you a feedback from uh, someone who can be re your real stakeholder customer so what do you think about it and do you have any tips actually that's a very good question and and things are changing very fast and you're very right um, like a year ago crowdfunding wasn't working for everyone it works for very specific type of projects as times are changing, as a, uh, one of the main problems with crowdfunding are the laws. In many countries, you cannot invest directly and get equity in a company through things like crowdfunding. It's, it's not legal. And that's actually one of the issues between crowdfunding platforms in the US and in Europe in general. So things are slightly changing and slowly changing, and now there are more laws that allow you to do that. So what's happening is there's, there's being a boom of people that are putting money. To be honest, I, I think it's a beautiful idea. I think that as long as people that are investing money know what they're going to get back from you, it's fine. Because I see a lot of projects in, like in Kickstarter that people think that we're going to get a free thing, a free blah, 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 and that's why they gave money. 
and in the end they don't get anything and then they get pissed. So there's a, there's I think there's a hard part of managing expectations there because you have a lot of investors. A lo you know when you when you just have one investor, it's easy to deal with them. When you have like 20 of them, it's not that easy. Okay, you have to be very very good at communicating what you're doing and what you what you want to do. That said, it's interesting that one what's happening now is some VCs are using crowdfunding to create funds, which I think that is actually a brilliant idea. So what they're doing is, hey, us as the uh, VCs, we're going to raise half of the fund, and the other half of the fund is going to be crowdfunded. And I think that model is actually, we're probably going to see that um, uh, more often. And I think it's a very good idea. I definitely think it's a very good idea. It's just, it's taking because of the legal uh, hurdles that you have with that. And especially, it, w it especially works for hardware projects. I mean, software projects, they're so intangible until you actually test them that a lot of people don't really kind of relate to them. And it's hard for them to put money in the project if they don't know you personally, you know? So, but it's slowly taking up. I, I definitely consider it a, a very good option. And probably in a year, we will we'll see a lot of changes in that field. Another question. Hi, Alex. I'm Bobby from London. Uh, got a question for you about your point of view of, on starting up as a single co-founder. <laughs> that is hell. <laughs> uh, been there, than that. Uh, if you can find a co-founder, please do. I mean, there's two sides to the story. It's, it's easier in terms of dealing with your ego because you're the only one calling the, the, calling the shots. Okay? So if you're a very opinionated person, being a sole co-founder is fantastic. After several months of work, after actually having something that has even a, a, a minimum amount of traction, you're going to regret that. It gets to a point where you're unable to cope with the amount of work you have. But then again, my first company wasn't successful, and so I didn't have issues with that. Now in my company right now, in Press42, I'm kind of getting on board some people. But until now, I was on my own. And trust me, it's, it's terrible. If you have a minimum exposure to people, it's just I cannot be everywhere doing everything, doing the marketing, doing the coding, doing the, you cannot do it. It's just like, it's, it's, not, it's not happy. It's not a happy place to be. So if you can find someone, make sure, as always, of course, I think it's common sense, find someone that you get along with. That when you have a fight, you know, after 30 minutes, you can go and have some beers and just chill out, okay? And especially one of the things I learned from my previous company, from the VC firm, was try and get people that share your same vision, that share the same path you're leading. If you have people that have a different, very, very different background and see the world in a very different way, be very careful with them. Because on the long run, your path will take you somewhere and their path will take them somewhere else. And that's where the problems arise. So just, I think it's common sense. But we all go through that and we all feel the pain and we all have big fights with our founders and depart the company. Shit happens. One more. Hi, I'm Bren from Slovakia. You said that we shall hire a writer. Uh, shall the writer uh, be a co-founder, or if the co-founders don't want what exactly the startup does, uh, does the writer ask the right questions, or how did you meant that? Well, I really meant like anyone you're hiring at your company, if you can get them to write good stuff, that's brilliant. But it's especially important for your co-founders. There's a, there's a very good reason that's especially important for your co-founders, which is they are the ones that have the dream. You need to have someone on the team that's able to translate the dream into words and move people. I still remember the first post we did at Tedwan Valley was the Tedwan Valley Manifesto. And I remember I wrote that like in half an hour and we put it online and we started getting gazillion emails and like hundreds of tweets from people saying, wow, this is inspiring, this is incredible. Of course, the next question was, how the fuck are you going to do that? Okay, so you need to be careful with managing expectations. But you need to, you, need, you want to have a co-founder or co-founders that are able to stand here and read you something and move people. You know, after a while, what you realize is that the companies that make it big are not the ones that have the best products, are the ones that are able to inspire people. You need that. 
Uh, okay, so as you said, it's really important to have a specific market before you develop something. Like you have to f have the need of people. Uh, but sometimes, like in things like gaming, you, your market is actually very broad. Like, wow, we're building a game. I guess our market is people who like to have fun. And uh, the thing was that I want to ask, do you have any recommendations on how to obtain this, you know, these people, how, how to know what your market is going to exactly be? Because we've had this experience of just building a product and thinking, okay, the younger people will play this. And it comes to that that all our players are in their 40s. And we were like, wow, and <laughs> then just pivoted all around. Well, actually, gaming is a very, very hard niche. And uh, I actually mentor a couple of gaming companies. And you know, the first time I saw them on stage, it was like this. The first company comes on stage and they go like, we're a gaming company. We are the coolest company out there because we have the best graphics. Company number two, we are the coolest startup in gaming because we have the best graphics. Company number three, we are the coolest and we are different because we have the best graphics. And you go like, does, it, does someone actually realize that both, like the three of them said the same shit? And I kept, I, I, started, I started working with them and I started talking with them and I said, well, the thing is, you need to choose. Even in gaming, it's, it's not just about f having fun. It's about who are you making have fun to? You know, is it a kid? And you choose. This is not about we're doing this thing and then we find the market. It's, hey, choose a market. Choose someone in that, in that niche that you want to help out. Maybe it's like people are fed up with Angry Birds and they want something different. Or maybe people are fed up with strategy games or hardcore gamer ga things that you need to spend like World of Warcraft, like three months or a year of your life or two years or three years of your life playing to have the Wizard of Oz with super mega powers, okay? There's different needs for different people. The question is, who do you want to help? That's a question, it's very personal, it's, it's, it's yours. And once you know that, you just need to know that, that people are outside in. You need to know what they eat in the morning. You need to know what is their favorite food. You need to know how many times they go and take a shit. You know, because if your game is gonna be played in the bathroom, you need to know how many times they shit, okay? So those are the kind of questions you need to ask yourself before even doing a single line of code. That is the issue. A lot of people start the loop the other way around. They first build the game, and then they say, like, who can we, who can, who can we send this shit to play with? It's, that's wrong. That's the, the other way around. Start with, who do we want to help? And talk to them, and listen to them. Hey, what type of games do you do? How many times do you play? Do you play casually? For example, I'm, I'm not a gamer, but there's some games that I just love, and I could play, like, for freaking ever. How many of you know Civilization? Really, really old game. Square game. For me, that was like the most stupid graphics, but I could spend freaking days playing that stuff. Okay, so you really need to know your people and then do the coding. I'm dead. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Have fun. <laughs>